win. He wants us to win holistically. And he will not let this fast end until our hearts are able to receive him. Bow your heads to you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. But more importantly, we thank you for who you are in our life. God, we thank you for every affliction that has opened our eyes to know that we are in need of a savior. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the truth that is your word. So Father, I pray that you would hide me behind your rugged cross. Yes. That you would reveal your glory for your name's sake, Heavenly Father. That your name would be high and lifted up. And that this body of believers who you called will have a heart to receive all that you have for them. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. Today, my brothers and sisters, I give you no new revelation. But what I do is bring a foundational re revelation to your remembrance and pray that it encourages you in this next season. Amen? So what we're going to do is we're going to read the scripture together, and then we're going to come back, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse. Amen? And the word of God says, while he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And he entered a village. As he entered a village, 10 leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. I want us to keep our minds uncleansed. Now one of them, it doesn't specify which of the ten. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed. This is letting me know that there is a difference between cleansing and healing. Praise God. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And the person that did that was a Samaritan. That's crazy. Can we go to the next slide? Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten that were cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. And he said to that foreigner, stand up and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Yes, Lord. This is showing me that there's a progression from cleansing to healing to wellness. Saints, I have not come to tickle your ears. The Spirit of the Lord wants to make us well. But the degree of our wellness is dependent on what we can receive in our heart. Go to the next slide for me. In order for you to truly understand what I mean by wellness, I have to give you some truths. And the first truth that you need to know is life is lived from the inside out. So when I say life is lived from the inside out, you need to understand what I'm saying, that what is on the inside establishes and values how I perceive what's on the outside. Do you understand that? What the world will try to tell you, though, is that what's going on on the outside should dictate how I perceive what's going on on the inside. And this is what the enemy tries to do. He tries to bombard your senses and your flesh with oppression and depression so that ultimately your faith is lost for what's dwelling on the inside of you. But God is saying not so. Because he wants to do something here, saints. When I spoke to you the first time, I told you God said we were going somewhere. 
But before we can get to that place, we had to deal with our identity. And now that we know who we are and whose we are, we need to be healed. The world system will have us to believe that life's lived from the outside and the enemy desires to choke the life that is in us by attacking us from the outside. Next slide, please. In the name of Jesus. Next slide, please. How do we get healing? There's four steps that I want to go through with you guys today. Knowledge, understanding, belief, and worship. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. These four steps will lead us to being well. Next slide. And it said that when he was on his way to Jerusalem, let me give you some context. When he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing, him being Jesus, between Samaria and Galilee. Now, Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, which signified the cross, Jesus, on his way to be the ultimate price for our sin, when he was on his way there, he stopped dead between Samaria and Galilee. Now, for my Bible theologians, they might understand that Samaria and Galilee had friction. They had friction because they had the same origin. Isn't it crazy that the person that is most similar to you is the one that makes you the most upset? The one who you have the most history with is the one that gets on your nerves the most. So, so, so who are the people of Galilee? For the sake of this message, I'm going to call them the self-righteous. Why? Because they were Jews. They were chosen of God. They had God's heart, and they knew the laws of God. But when they saw him, they denied him. Rather, trusting in their ability to follow the law than to submitting the one who had conquered the law, the self-righteous. And then you have the Samaritans. The Samaritans started off as Jews, but along the way started to worship foreign gods and they intermingled with Gentiles. And as a result, they lost sight of God and said that worshiping was in a place and not in a person. They said, we worship on this mountain because our history says so. I'm going somewhere. And it's in between this place of the self-righteous And the carnal-minded, when I say carnal-minded, all carnal-minded means is my mind is based and predicated only on what I can touch, see, feel. It's only on my senses. So on his way to the cross, arm stretched, he stops smack between the self-righteous and the carnal-minded, asking them both to draw near unto him. And as he came, into the city, 10 leprous men. Go to the next slide for me. So, judgment based on what is seen, self-righteous versus carnal living. This is the thing. It's how religion looks at the sinner. The self-righteous is righteous only by, they only elevate by decreasing somebody else. So in order for me to be righteous, somebody has to be unrighteous. That's right. That's right. And this is how the world is looking at the church. Have you ever met somebody that doesn't go to church? They go, why would I want to go there? They're judgmental. They don't understand what's going on. Do you understand the friction between the Galileans and the Samaritans was so strong that the Jews refused to go through through Samaria in order to get to Jerusalem? They prefer to go through a barren land longer in distance than to have interaction with the Samaritans. All the while, not realizing they have the same origin. Isn't this the church? Isn't this what religion teaches us? I came to God because I was stained and dirty in my sins. He cleansed me and then somewhere along the lines, because my outer sin was cleansed, It now gives me the authority to judge those who haven't come into the revelation of who Christ is. 
So I live my life within the four walls of this church thinking I do well by coming to church all the while the city around me is dying? Is this what love is? My salvation is now predicated on what I do and not who I serve. This is how the world is looking at us. But how are we looking at the world? We're looking at them as a lost cause, not worth giving our time, an inconvenience to the trivial pursuit of what I do in life. So when I'm driving to work and I see the dope fiend linked over like this, my heart says, they should have known God, oh well. Mm-hmm. What about the God dwelling in my us? God. Jesus. But this is the kicker. God in the middle, calling in all those who would listen, realizes that affliction levels the playing field for both. Mm-hmm. Say that, sir. Say it again. When the saint is afflicted and calling for Jesus, There is no difference than when the sinner is calling for Jesus because pain is dominating both of their lives. There is no time for judgment. All that I know is I am hurting and I am in need of a Savior. And here's Jesus walking into the town for the sake of the self-righteous and the carnal-minded. All the while, the outward man sees differences. But God doesn't look at the outward man. God looks at the heart. And all the time, he sees the same person struggling in need of healing. Next slide. And it says, when he entered the village, 10 leprous men. Now, this is the thing about leprosy. This affliction called leprosy. Like, if you do your research, they can't pinpoint the specific diagnosis of what leprosy is. They diagnose it based off of the symptoms that you have. Isn't this the case with sin? I can't really tell the origin of it. I can't really tell where I picked it up. I can't even tell if it was me or if I contracted it by standing in proximity to somebody who has it. This is what leprosy said. You could catch it by even the company that you kept. Not only was leprosy painful on the external, boils, busting up on your skin, popping open. Not only was it painful, it signified death. So there was an isolation that happened when somebody had leprosy in the community. Your brothers and sisters who thought it was cool before, the minute they saw you suffering from the affliction, you recognized, you portrayed death and you were no longer allowed in the community. That produces a shame, a shame that what I have contracted is now keeping me away from the people that called me family. Cleansing and healing. And here they are, all 10, carnal-minded and self-righteous, standing afar from the one that had the power to heal. Hear me on this. Your proximity to Jesus reveals his heart, your heart for him. Your proximity to Jesus reveals your heart to him. Practical example. When people are worshiping here at the altar, and there are some who are afar off, I don't judge. They are afar off because there is something in their hearts that are hindering them from accepting the love that God has for them. That's right. There's something on the inside that has hardened their heart to receive the thing that God wants to give them. So here where they are. Ten, self-righteous and carnal-minded, all standing afar. Thank you, Lord. Just give me the mic. It don't matter. Next slide. All standing afar, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
If you're going to be well, the first thing you need to know is Jesus is master. <laughs> now, now, this is the kicker. Knowledge is not belief. Please don't. But knowledge is needed before you ascend to belief. So here they are, standing afar, because their sickness hinders them from getting close, but their hearts are hardened to get closer to the one that is healing. So they stand afar off, and I don't judge because at least they did something. And it says they stood. To stand means to signify a decision. They made a decision to wait on God and cry out, Master, have mercy on me. Master, the master that my granny told me about. The master that my mom is always talking about. The master that my daddy's always talking about. That master that I have knowledge of, have mercy on me. Mercy. Mercy. Jesus, who is love, have mercy on me. Do you think that Jesus wants to only have mercy on you? Is that what he went to the cross for? To have mercy on you? Love, he says, is shown when you lay your life down for a friend. That's it. He didn't come so that he might have pity. This is what mercy means, pity. Master, pity me. Look at me as less than I am. But this is the thing about Jesus. He loves us enough to meet us where we are. But will always challenge us to go further than we think we can go. So it says, Jesus, Master, this Jesus that they talk about, have pity on me. And go to the next slide. And what does Jesus say? It says, when he saw. Now you need to understand what this word saw means. Remember, our lives are lived from the inside out and not the outside in. Jesus saw, it means to perceive in the soul. It means to see with the mind's eye. So what am I saying? It's saying, Jesus looked into your heart and saw what you had need of and responded to where you were, even though his heart wanted to give you so much more. He saw where you were and said, I can't love you too much because if I do, it might turn you away. So let me meet you where you are and have mercy on you. Have mercy on us. No differential between the self-righteous and the sinner. We all in the same affliction together. Have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go and prove yourselves to the priest. Now, in, in, in Jewish tradition, in order to be deemed clean, you needed somebody to deem you clean. The priest couldn't make you clean, Come on. but he can call you clean. Come on. Now, Jesus is seeing what your heart is asking for in the request. Jesus, have mercy on us, and he sees the heart. He sees they don't want to be healed. They just want to be cleansed. All I need is for you to take the filth off of the external so I can continue living the life that I was living before my interaction with you. I'm not here to tickle your ears. (laughs) I'm here to give you truth. And he saw them in their heart and what they needed. And they said, have mercy on us. And Jesus obliged and said, I will have pity on you. Go and prove that after your encounter with me, you have been made cleansed. You can't go to the priest unless you are cleansed. But he threw out the word and told them that if they obeyed the word, they would be cleansed. Saints. The word of God in itself has the power to cleanse. Cleanse. To remove filth. 
externally. External. It has the power to cleanse the physical pain of that addiction. You can't hide it anymore. The affliction is being manifested on the outside. And now that you've been banished from your family as a wino, you've placed your faith in this Jesus that they talk about. And as, and as you're standing afar off, you say, hey, Jesus, this man I have knowledge of, have mercy on me so I can go back to doing what I was doing before. That's real good, Doc. That's so good, sir. And the thing is, Jesus is obliged to do it. So he, get, he says, Go show yourself and prove that you've been cleansed. See, the word of God has the power to cleanse. But this is something that we need to know. You don't get cleansed until you obey it. My God. It has the power to cleanse. But if you don't submit to it, ain't nothing going to change. So he tells them to go show themselves to the priest. And they obeyed. And because they obeyed, as they walked, they were made cleansed. Next verse. Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, the external filth was removed from their lives. But as we see here, there's a progression. Because life is lived from the inside out, not the outside in. So if the outside is cleansed, but the inside is not well, then I haven't finished the healing process. My God. Right. Now one of them, it doesn't specify who. It doesn't specify who. We naturally think it's the Samaritan because we read it all the time. But it doesn't specify who. But one, in their hearts, when they saw they had been healed. Remember we saw that word saw? That means an internal look to perceive and discern. Discern what? That I have been supernaturally healed by God as the great physician. What does healed mean though? To alleviate a person's distress and anguish. Saints, there's an external pain that comes with affliction. There's an external shame that comes with affliction. But whatever gives the flesh pain taints the soul. Say that. The rape happened 10 years ago. Uh -huh. But you're still in the same place. Uh -huh. Because you're fighting the fact that your soul has been tainted. Uh. My God. The mistake happened years ago. Uh -huh. But you can't get out of it. Your soul. My God. That's it. But you've got to understand that life is lived from the inside out and not the outside in. Uh -huh. See, this was the danger of leprosy. It was extremely painful, but after a while, it actually took your sensation away. Talk to us. Meaning, if you let that thing harden your skin enough, uh -huh. you would be unable to feel anything anymore. And this is what's going on in the souls of even us as saints. We've been hurt. And because we're concerned about the filth that other people see on the outside, in our own strength, we've tried to cover up the taint of the hurt that's in it, been inflicted on our soul, and in that have created a prison so that God can get on the inside. means to alleviate distress and anguish. My brother, my sister, I know it hurt, and you didn't deserve it. And I don't know why God allowed you to go through it, but what I know is he wants to heal you from it. Yes, Lord. Not the outer part. Thank you, Lord. He wants to heal the inner man. Thank you, Lord. The one that is too afraid to tell somebody else because you're afraid they're gonna say you should be over it by now. Jesus. But they don't dictate your healing. They don't dictate your healing. Yeah, right. And if your heart is willing, God is standing here yeah. 
to make you well. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank Next you. slide. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And it says that when he saw internally that he had been healed and relieved of anguish and distress, he turned back glorifying God. So go to the next slide real quick. Belief is nothing more than the knowledge of who God is mixed with a personal understanding of who he is to you. When you take the knowledge of who he is and apply it to your life, it increases belief. I trust that he did it for Jeff, Pastor Jeff, but until he does it for me, it's nothing more than knowledge. But God is not concerned with what we know. He's concerned with what we believe. And if you're going to believe him, you've got to open your heart to allow the word inside of you. Because obedience will only last while the flesh is clean. But the truth is, the flesh will get dirty again. We're imperfect people. We will sin again. But what he's trying to do is allow the cleansing on the outside to get on the inside so that you might, your personal experience might get you to submit to the truth of who he is. God is not asking you to be obedient because of his power. He's asking you to be obedient because the word will heal you. But if your heart doesn't receive it, your soul will still be broken. And Jesus is saying, I can't take you into your season of blessing until I heal your soul. Because your soul is realer than the thing that you're looking for. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? You keep emptying out the fridge saying that the diet's going to work this time. Don't you know that it's not on the outside that's killing you? There's a void on the inside that's got you running to the food. It's not the liquor that you need to worry about. It's the void that you think the liquor is filling. There is a void in your heart that he wants to heal. Are you willing to trust him enough to let him in and do it? I know you're mad that he let you go through it. I know it hurt. He understands, though. And I can't explain why he allowed you to go through it. I can't. But I have personal experience with his heart. And I believe that he's the rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So So belief. Back one slide. Let's go to the scripture. And it says, when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, turning back from the direction he was going in order to honor God. That sounds like repentance to me. Talk good, sir. Talk good, sir. That's all repentance is. It's saying, I was going in this direction, but because I had an experience with Jesus and he did something on the inside, that is now being manifested on the outside, I owe it to him to turn from where I was going and go back and give him the honor that he deserves. Glorifying God, God signifies authority. So this one man that I had the knowledge who was master, after I've had a personal experience with him, I understand that he was the one sent of God. There is no other way by which a man can be saved. No other. Because there's no other man who has the power of God dwelling in him bodily. So when the revelation comes of who he just got in contact with, because this man was able to cleanse what everybody saw, but have a personal experience with him based on what nobody understood but you, that showed you that it had to be God. Who else could know? the hurt and the anguish that I was suffering from. And who else could care enough to cleanse me and heal me of that? When the personal revelation comes, belief drops, and I have to turn from what I was doing and honor the one who saves my soul. 
very good, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Belief enters us in to worship. Gratitude is the attitude necessary for glorifying God. God allows you to have a personal experience with him so that you might know him personally. And when you experience him, if your heart is open, you give him praise for what he's done. You cannot worship until you enter into his courts with praise. The praise opens your heart to worship. Before I can honor him for who he is, I've got to honor him for what he's done for me. That is the very understanding of how I got to his character. When he demonstrated his character in my life personally. No experience, no worship. I can tell, I can tell the seasoned saints by their worship. I can tell the seasoned saints by their worship. Not their age, by their worship. Because worship tells me that you've been through the fire with him. Worship tells me that you've been through a situation that you couldn't have got out of in your own strength. And somehow you had an encounter with someone who not only got you out of that, but healed your real man. The person who dwells on the inside of this outer flesh is who is real. Your soul. And Jesus is not concerned with this. He's concerned with your soul. Gratitude increases our altitude. It is the attitude necessary for glorifying God. Not only that, gratitude draws our hearts near to God in worship. Go back to the scripture for me. I want to show you something funny. Look at, look at verse 12. And as he entered the village... Ten leprous men stood at a distance to him. This is with the knowledge. But look what happens when he enters into gratitude. He turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and fell on his face at his feet. Do you see how the heart increased the proximity to God? So good. After I had the experience and I understand the one who did it, I have no choice but to have a heart of gratitude, and that gratitude will lead me to the feet of the one who healed me. I'm not trying to entertain y'all. It's a new season. And if you're going to receive the blessing God has for us, you've got to see it from the inside out. And he turned back glorifying God. How do we glorify God? We give him the fruit of our lips. Listen. So when Maya and Charles and, and these anointed singers are up here glorifying God, they are giving you an, an ability to get into the flow of the spirit. They're not trying to convince you to do anything. They're giving you an opportunity to sing the words, attach it to your personal experience, and increase your belief. And if I increase your belief, I open your heart to receive healing. Hear me, please. God is not concerned with us being entertained in this church. There are other churches for that. God is concerned with us being well. He, he glorified God with his voice and fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks unto him. Mm. And he was the Samaritan. What? He was the Samaritan. He was the one who lived the carnal life. Out of the other, out of all of the ten, he was the one that came back. God doesn't look at the outer man. God looks at the heart. Next slide. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Didn't I, didn't I meet all ten of them according to where they were? But the nine, where are they? He's talking to the disciples, by the way. But the nine, where are they? 
was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. So when he's saying foreigner, he's talking about the outer man. But this is the thing that you need to know about worship. It identifies you with God. My God. My God. Because your worship has everything to do with your heart. And God said that you look at the outer man, but I look at the heart. He loved David because he was a man after his own heart, not knowledge. He was a man after his own heart. So I need you to understand this thing really quick because we spiritualize faith too much sometimes. Faith is a matter of the heart. Yes, it's spiritual, but it is accessed through the realm of the heart. Hebrews 11 says, faith is the substance of things. How do you hope? How do you hope? I hope with my heart. Knowledge can't bring hope. It can assist with hope. But unless my heart is attached to the knowledge, there will be no submission to the thing that I'm hoping in. Hear me. Your heart is blocking you from believing what you need. You don't need more faith. You need to receive more grace. I know. I know you're disappointed in yourself. It's okay. A just man isn't a perfect man. A just man is one who gets up again. And God is telling the church today to get up again. Because if you open your heart enough to trust me again, I will make you well. You don't have to isolate anymore. The shame is gone. You've been cleansed. And if they don't accept you, they weren't going to accept you in the first place. You don't have to conform anymore because revelation has hit your heart. And when revelation hits, it changes your direction. So I'm going to give you this, this, this scientific analogy. There are parts of the ocean that have more oxygen than on the land. There are times where if you go 10 feet deep, there might be 10% of oxygen. And if you stay in that place, you will die. But do you know that if you went deeper, there are places 100 and 200 feet deep that have more oxygen in the deeper levels than they do in the shallow levels. Hear me. If you want to breathe, you need to go deeper into his grace. You've got to go deeper. He's calling you deeper, and the only thing that's stopping is your opinion of yourself. But I hear the Apostle Paul saying, I don't even judge myself anymore. God is not going to let us into this season of blessing until he addresses our hearts. Receive the grace that he has for you. Because your faith is attached to your heart, and your heart will allow you to be made well. Next slide. What does well mean? Look at this. The word well means to save. To save, it is the root word for salvation. The word well means to save, to heal, to rescue, to preserve. It's the same word we find in Matthew 12, where Jesus says, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold but it's the one who endures to the end. He will be made well. 
Go back to the, the scripture for me. Let's read it again. And, and he said to him, stand up again and go your way because your heart has rescued you. Your heart has preserved you and your ability to receive me has given you salvation. Mm. Salvation, that's a heavy word. If, does this mean that he was saved right then? I don't know. And if I said I did, I'd be lying to you. But I do know that the Pharisees asked right after Jesus told this foreigner that his heart had made him saved. And the Pharisees go, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed by your external man. You're not going to see it with the things that are carnal. Look, here it is, or look, there it is. You won't be able to see it. Why? For the kingdom of God is in you. How is he going to rescue you? By putting his very life in you. Jesus. Saints, God makes us well by giving us him and allowing the spirit to quicken our souls and direct us into all truth and understanding. If you want to be made well, your heart's got to receive its salvation. Now, some of you are going to be like, Brother Troy, I'm saved already. Like, how does that apply to me? Salvation isn't a one-time thing. Jesus does not save you and leave you. What Jesus does to save you is he puts his spirit in you, called the paraclete, the comforter, comfort which deals with the heart. He gives you the comforter to walk alongside of you and power you to walk into the direction that he's calling you to walk. The paraclete doesn't come to your flesh, though. It comes to your soul. Why? Because life is lived from the inside out and not the outside in. This is not us. God desires to rescue us in the soul and then in the spirit. Now, this last thing and I'm done. Some of us are dealing with afflictions in Christ and wondering, what about me? Like, this man was healed, he received salvation, but what about the afflictions I feel after I've been saved? God wants us to have a deeper revelation of what life is. And when he places his life in you, there's nothing that can happen here that can take life out of you. Hear me. When he puts his life in you, there's nothing that can happen on the outside of it that will take your life away. 2 Corinthians, read this and then I'm done. Therefore, we do not lose heart. This is Paul. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man, the soul and the spirit, the real man, is being renewed day by day. It's through the outer decay that our very inner man is being strengthened. No decay, no strengthening. No decay, no strengthening. For this momentary, in the span of eternity, for this momentary light affliction is producing for us an external weight of glory far beyond comparisons. Why is it doing that? Because we have a heart and understand the revelation that we look not on the things that are seen. For the things we, which are seen are temporal. But we now look at the things that are unseen, life starting from the inside out, because that thing that is not seen is eternal. I'm done. I'm done. But I need you to understand this. As we go into this next season as a church, 
God wants to do more than bless you externally. He wants to heal your soul, and he wants to make you well. Even if wellness comes at the expense of this flesh. Because the fact of the matter is, we will get dirty again. But when he heals our soul and seals it with his life, we never die, but we live eternally. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Would you stand on your feet with me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be used as a vessel for your kingdom. I thank you that your word is incorruptible seed. And my prayer is that each and every person under the sound of my voice would receive your word with their heart. Not with the knowledge of who you are, but that they would take it and have a personal relationship with it. That they might believe. Lord, I pray that you would deal with each person individually to know that you have taken away the stain of that thing in their soul. I thank you that each and every one of us in this room are a new creature, Lord. And I thank you ultimately that you have made us well and well for eternal life. So as Pastor Jeff comes and opens the altar, I pray that no one would be ashamed of what somebody would say, but that they would get things right with you. We all have affliction, but you are able to heal us and make us well. So have your way in this place. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our spirits. And as we end this fast tomorrow, allow our hearts to receive all that you have for us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.